I love you guys. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you want to be disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm glad you want to know your word. Uh, that's what we're all about. Loving God, loving each other, learning to be disciples of the word of God. Open up to Acts chapter 12, please, and let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we're your children. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that you came to break down the walls of things that separate us. And you pray that we would be one, even as you and the Father are one. Lord, I ask that by your Spirit, Holy Spirit, you'd come and you would reveal your word to us. And that you would help us through this time as we head towards communion together. Lord, you're good. All your ways are good. Bless this time we ask this in Jesus' precious name. And everybody says? Yes. Uh, one of the things I'm really enjoying as we're going through the book of Acts this time around is I'm playing, I'm paying, <laughs> playing, I'm paying closer attention to those people that we're meeting along the way. Don't you have some warm spot in your heart for Cornelius? Yeah. Don't you have a warm spot in your heart for Barnabas? Yeah, and Peter and James and all the rest of them that we're meeting as we go through this. Saul, it was kind of tough to have a warm spot in your heart towards Saul, huh? But I'm telling you, by the time the book's over, it's really going to soften towards Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul. But I, I just love it because as I look at these folks and as I study them, I've come across the response they're just regular people, aren't they? They're just regular folk, just like us. But God does some extraordinary things through them because they've given their total selves to God to use as he sees fit. And so I think to myself, that's supposed to be our story. That's supposed to be your story, that God takes our ordinariness and does extraordinary things with it that we end up having antenna that says lord who do you want me to talk to today who do you want me to pray for we have the group coming uh what hpc, HPC is coming uh for alternate uh schooling oh no, that's not. oh no 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 well, yeah the homeschooling folks are going to come visit us. And then also the HPC, which stands for Horizon Pregnancy Center. They're going to come visit us. If, if a group called Horizon Pregnancy Center is coming to visit this church family with their mobile unit in the parking lot, don't you think perhaps God's going to tap some of us on the shoulder and encourage us and have us run into somebody who needs their services? Wouldn't that make sense? I think we need to be aware of those kinds of things. How does God want to use your life? Well, you've got to, you got to get up to bat. <laughs> you know, you've got to walk up there and get, get up to bat. You know, I, I told you that in, uh, in high school, I played a lot of sports. My dad super encouraged me uh, to play sports and he came to all of my games. <laughs> uh, and I played football, basketball, and I ran track. And uh, I think he encouraged me to do that so that I would be too tired to get into trouble. And uh, for the most part, it worked pretty good. <laughs> it really is. I look back, I go, Dad, that was brilliant, you know. <laughs> Can't be out of trouble. I was too tired when I went home. At any rate, uh, one thing that I did not like a lot was if I practiced all week really hard and I didn't get put into the game. Bench, a bench warmer. I hated that. I would be like, if I'm going to suffer <laughs> all week long and try my best, I want in the game. And I believe that same way about our faith. If I'm going to go through trials and tribulations of life, if I'm going to spend time in God's word, if I'm going to study, listen, and do my best to obey, that Jesus put me in the game. Don't put me on the bench, Lord. I want in the game. Let's go. Yeah, will I make mistakes? Everybody does. 
We all stumble and fall, but at least get up to bat. Baseball was the one game I didn't play. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Chapter 12 is where we're at. Uh, interesting thing, we're still kind of watching, if you will, the fledgling, the first steps of the early church. Yeah, they're spirit-filled, but they're doing their very best to understand the gospel. They're doing their very best to follow after Jesus, and they're trying very hard to understand how this all works. And guess what? So are we. In so many ways, we're trying to figure things out. How does this work? How does this apply? How does this happen? And so the subject matters that are in Acts chapter 12, well, they deal with persecution, which, by the way, is a promise of God. The Lord Jesus promised you're going to have trial and tribulation. He said, look how they treated me. And are the servants greater than the master? If they treated me this way, what do you think they're going to do to you? So underline that promise in your Bible, the promised Bible. I've never seen that in a list of God's promises, but it's there. The next thing that we're going to see is a king. And this particular king is probably one of the proudest, evilest, in a long line of proud and evil kings. And we're going to see him, and he's going to flex his muscles, and he's going to show how much he knows. So we're going to watch that as well. We're also going to enter the subject of prayer. And I'll tell you what, today, all of my prayers have been answered. Sometimes with yes, sometimes with no, sometimes with not now. So we're going to deal with the subject of prayer. But as it said, an army uh, advances on its stomach. <laughs> they have to eat and have the strength to fight. But the church advances on its knees in prayer. That's how we get ahead. Because prayer is that oxygen hose. Prayer is that loving connection between you and headquarters from heaven. We also deal with one of my very favorite subjects, which is the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over everything and everybody. And nothing happens in this world, in this universe, spiritual, natural, or otherwise, that doesn't first have to pass through our sovereign God. He is Lord. He is Lord of all. And that, to me, is thrilling. Because this Lord of all loves me. And he loves you. And he has your best eternal interest at heart at all times. Is it rough down here on planet Earth? You bet. Look at the book of Revelation. We're heading towards rougher waters. But God is with us. And he promises never to leave us. And any tear that you shed here is wiped away in heaven. So we'll deal with the sovereignty of God as well. But let's get right into it, shall we? Acts chapter 12, verse 1. And I'm just going to walk us through, point some things out. Now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Notice uh, what this guy's name is. Herod. Now, that's interesting because... As you go through the scriptures, you see a Herod, and then you see that Herod died. Then you see another Herod, and then you see that Herod died. And then there's all these different Herods, and all the Herods are different. So I don't want you to think of Herod as a name. I want you to think of Herod as a title. So there is Herod the Great. He was famous for building, and you could still see the ruins of Herod the Great, if you go to Israel. And Herod the Great is the same Herod who had all the babies in Bethlehem murdered because he was trying to kill Jesus. This Herod the Great was treacherous. 
But the succeeding Herods, the next Herod in line, was one that participated in the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Then there's another Herod. <laughs> they just keep coming, more and more Herods. They, Herods were the ones that the Romans put in charge of that area. So uh, you'll be hard pressed to find a Herod in the Bible that you like. You're not gonna find one. They're horrible. And when I say horrible, I'm not kidding. The, the joke of the Romans, and I think they enjoyed it, was that it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be Herod's family. He put his wives to death, all of them. His brother, one stole his brother's wife. Another one put his sons to death. And then one of the Herods actually put out a decree that said, when I die, I want all of these, and he names all these various leaders, be put to death when I die. Because I know that when I die, because everybody hates me, there's gonna be a celebration. And I don't want a celebration when I die. So put all these people to death so that it'll be sad. Well, guess what they did after he died? They celebrated and they tore up that law that he wrote. <laughs> so they're terrible. So this guy stretches out his hand to harass some of the church. Now you're saying, why would he harass the church? This Herod, which was Herod Antipas I, he thinks he's a Jew. You want to know who he's a descendant of? He's a descendant of Esau. Who's Esau? When it, when it, that's right, Jacob's brother. And they were called the Edomites. Edomites? Edomites. <laughs> and so he's a descendant of them, and he wanted to be Jewish. So he went through the rituals. He had the circumcision and what have you. And uh, he was trying to garner their favor. So he saw that the Jews did not like the Christians and had begun to persecute them after Saul's attempt to wipe out the church by killing what martyr? Stephen. Stephen. And so he thought, well, if that made them happy, then let me also do the same, and that will make me friends with the Jews. Verse 2, And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Now this James is, you know, you had the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, but three of them seemed to have a special place, didn't they? They seem to get into more things and to see more than the others. Have you noticed that? And who were they? Peter, James, and John. They got called in that room when Jesus raised uh, Talitha from the dead. They were called ahead at the transfiguration of Jesus. They just seem to be involved in more things directly with Jesus than the others. Not that the others weren't, but... This is James, and he's the brother of John. And he was martyred by this Herod, who is stretching out, you know, and doing this. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, they were like, hip, hip, hooray, James is dead. Do you, do you know what? There was a time when the mother of James and John came to Jesus. Anybody remember this? Shortly before the crucifixion. And as moms will do, they were like, hey Jesus, can my sons sit on the left hand and the right side of you? Aren't moms great? <laughs> so that's moms for you. Always praying for their kids. Uh, Jesus then tells James and John, can you guys drink of the cup that I'll drink from? And they were like, yeah, absolutely. But what was Jesus talking about? 
Yeah, suffering, persecution, death, yeah. And that's what happened to James. So Jesus, in a way, foretold this. You're going to suffer this. So when he saw how good that worked, that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter. Now, do you remember back early on in the book of Acts where Peter was put in jail? And then all of a sudden, the next morning, he was there back at the temple preaching again? <laughs> that must have fried those uh, people that arrested him, you know? He just, the Lord just escaped, gave him the great escape. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread and Passover kind of run together. And the thought is, since Herod wanted to please the Jews, he wasn't going to put Peter to death during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. But right when it was over, Peter would know that that next day, that was going to be it for him, right? So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him, check this out, to four squads of soldiers. That's 16 soldiers to keep him intended to bring him before the people after Passover, which is thought to be, in our story, like the next day. Now, the way that this worked was, Herod was like, I heard Peter got away one time, he's not going to get away again. So I'm going to give him these 16 guards, and they're going to work in rotation. Every six hours, four of them are going to watch Peter. They, one was handcuffed to his right, right hand, and to the guard, and the other one handcuffed, and then handcuffed to the guard, and then two guards were outside. <laughs> Doesn't look like Peter's going to get away, does it? This is, like, this is like overboard protection. So that's the position that he's in. So as we look at Herod, just in the few verses that we've looked at, he does these three things. He harasses, he kills, and he imprisons. Who does that sound like? Harasses, kills, imprisons. Sounds like the enemy, doesn't it? The enemy of your soul and mine. Hey, guys, here's what the enemy wants to do in your life. He wants to harass you. He wants to kill off your relationship with God and other believers. And he wants to imprison you in some kind of a sin that won't let you go. This, these Herods are tremendous examples of Satan. These Herods, catch this, I'm going to take this a step further if you can believe that. This, these Herods are also an example of the coming Antichrist. My goodness, how, it wasn't that many years ago that I stood before this church and taught and I wondered, how in the world will the Antichrist be able to control everybody? I mean, that doesn't seem possible to me. How will the Antichrist be able to keep people from buying things or selling things? I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? Don't you see the technology today? And don't you see the politics at work? And by the way, the Antichrist is going to be the most charismatic political leader ever to walk on the scene. And he's going to be demon-possessed by the head demon, Satan himself. Wow! Guys, we're living in exciting times. And the Lord has put us here for his purposes and his plan. Don't be afraid. Be blessed. Be thankful that God should choose your life to live at this particular time. Verse 5 says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer, another translation instead of constant has the word earnest. Earnest prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So somewhere along the line, the church said, oh no, Peter's in trouble. We saw what happened to James, the brother of John. And now Peter is in jail and he's locked up good. And he's got Roman guards 
And we know this Herod is terrible. Let's pray. So they all began to pray for Peter. That Peter, Peter would be let go by God once again. That was the hope. But you may say, well, what's earnest prayer? What is constant prayer? What does it look like? Did, is something going to happen because they're of great faith? Is something going to happen because they were at it all the time? You can take, if you have a group of believers around you, if you have prayer teams, if you have outward and upward uh, ministry that will give you a call, my goodness, you're in, you're in much better shape because that means that this was for Peter, but guess what? So-and-so needs a job. Let's go into constant prayer for them. So-and-so has a health matter. Let's go into constant prayer for them. So-and-so needs whatever. Let's pray for them. So-and-so has an addiction. Let's pray for them. So-and-so, so-and-so, and what, and what, and what. Constant prayer added by the church. This is to be us covered all the time by the impact and the power of prayer. As I used to say, and I haven't said it for a while, a little prayer, a little power. More prayer, more power. Much prayer, much power. Not that it's because it's on our head or our doing, but God has chosen to work through the avenue of prayers. God is sovereign, but somehow he's decided he wants to take you by the hand and he wants you to participate in the completion of his will. That's prayer. Don't you, when you love somebody, don't you want to talk to them? You know, I remember years ago, uh, there was a couple in our church, a young couple, and uh, uh, before they got married, they used to talk on the phone at nighttime together. And they used to fall asleep. <laughs> so the line was always open <laughs> all night long, you know. I remember one time I wanted to see Jeannie and talk to her so bad that I, I had to teach on a Sunday. But this was before we got married. And then I drove, you know, uh, all se six, seven hours to go see her. And then turned right around and drove back. Because when you love somebody, you want to be with them. God loves you. He wants to be with you. He's always trying to get your attention. He's always right there. Can I help you with that? Let's do it together. It'll go better if you ask for my help. He's always right there. Constant prayer is a constant tie line between you and the Lord. Verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, so... When it says that, I take it to myself that that would be the next day. Herod's about to bring Peter out. The church is still praying. That night, Peter was sleeping. <laughs> now, how do you think you'd be the night before they were going to take the sword to your head? I don't know that I could sleep very well. Why is Peter sleeping? Peter is the one guy in the scriptures that it, we get to see him asleep three different times. Peter has this three thing going on, doesn't he? So let's think about where we saw Peter asleep. Jesus takes Peter up to the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter promptly Sleeping. fell asleep. <laughs> then Jesus uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane said, Peter, come pray with me. And Peter promptly fell asleep. <laughs> And here's Peter again, the one guy in the scripture that we get to see sleeping three times. Apparently, Peter had no problem sleeping. <laughs> but you would say, why, why on this night? Why on this night was Peter able to sleep? Yeah, the church is playing for his peace and comfort, and I think that that's part of it. But you know what I think? Peter's probably in his 30s here, maybe under 35. He's just a kid. And uh, the Lord had just told him, if you remember when he restored him, or no, it's actually before that. He said to him, Peter, when you're old, 
Some people will lead you and take you away and bind you where you do not want to go. Is Peter old here? I think Peter is relying on the promise of Jesus. On that prophecy that he gave over him. I think Peter was there as like, well, he got me out of jail last time. And I really don't consider myself old. <laughs> so I think the Lord's going to keep me around longer. He said, when you're old, I'm not old. I guess I'm going to make it through this. That's my thinking on that subject. Verse 7. Oh, wait. Uh, verse 6 again. Peter was sleeping, bound to chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel. Do angels work in the life of the church? Yes, they do. Do I believe that angels are here? I mean, like right here. I mean, like right now. I do. I believe that angels are here. I believe that they watch over us. I believe they watch over the church family. I believe that they jump into worship with us. Okay, not to be too weird on you. But there are some times when I'm worshiping that I actually hear other instruments. <laughs> okay, you may say, Paul, you need to get a checkup. Maybe so. But I honestly do. I'm like, Lord, I hear strings. We don't have any strings in here. I'd be like, Lord, I hear horns, you know. Is that you, Lord? Then the other day I was like, wow, I hear a piano. And I was like, no, that's Helen. <laughs> <laughs> Who plays beautiful piano, by the way. Now, So an angel is going to get involved in this. An angel of the Lord stood by him. Did that wake Peter up? No. Then the angel turns on a light. And a light shone in the prison. Did that wake Peter up? No. And he struck Peter on the side. <laughs> saying to him, arise quickly. Do, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of uh, every mom with every school kid. <laughs> they, come, they come to the door. Did your mom do this? My mom would come to the door. Paul, it's time to get up now. Then she'd come back, flip on the light. <laughs> Paul, it's time to get up. And then, when I was going to be late, arise quickly. <laughs> Which is what the angel said. And the chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie your sandals. Again, exactly what my mom used to say. Put your socks and shoes on, tie your shoes, right? And put a clean shirt on. There it is right there. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. I don't know, but I, I see a lot of comedy in here. But maybe that's just me. But I would like to see the actual event happen. Or I'd like to see Rochelle put on a play where this happens. You know, I just think it's funny. That poor angel. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. So he's still sound asleep. Uh, which, you can ask my wife, is a lot like me before that first cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> it's like, don't talk to me, give me a cup of coffee. Verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate, which leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Can you imagine that? Automatic doors at this time. Right there. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. Angels are so awesome. We've talked about them on a number of occasions. They want no credit. They only want one thing. Do, the, do their job and please the Lord. Shouldn't we be like that? Rather than, look what I did, you know. Oh, do you see me? Oh, we need to just drop all that. We'll see the importance of that too in this chapter. Dropping everything else. So, uh, Peter was asleep at his deliverance. There he is. He's, uh, he's stuck. He's left in the middle of a street. And uh, he still doesn't know what's going on. Verse 11. 
And when Peter had come to himself, <laughs> which uh, another thing I wish I could have seen, hello, where, where am I? <laughs> you know, what's going on? Uh, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jews. I'll be honest with you. I stopped here and I thought to myself, Why did James have to die? Wasn't the church praying for him? James was young. James was one of the ones that was right there, Peter, James, and John. James died early, but Peter was spared. But I was like, how does this prayer thing work again, God? And I know that sometimes people don't pray like they ought to. Because they say, oh, well, God's sovereign. He's going to do what he wants. Absolutely. But the picture I get is more like this. I remember, uh, or I want you to picture a dad working with a young boy. Maybe he's fixing a car or fixing something else in the house. And he says, hey, son, you want to come help me out? Knowing that there's no way that kid knows how to use any equipment, nor knows the tools, nor knows what the dad is doing or how to do it. Why does the dad involve the kid? To learn, to have relationship, so that the dad's thinking rubs off on the sun. Same way with the Lord. He has chosen that you're to spend time with him. And if you wonder, how come some people hear God's voice more clearly than others? And that's because they spend more time with him. You know how it is when you get a phone call from a loved one? All they have to say is, hello, right? <laughs> Just the, that one word. And somewhere between the H and the O, you decipher, I know exactly who this is. Sometimes by just that one word, hello, you know what their emotional state is. <laughs> you know what kind of day they're having. Why is that? Because you've spent so much time with them. You know their ways. You know them. And so when they say, hello, you can read volumes into it. Well, the same for you and for me. Spend that much time with God, which is called prayer. If you don't want to call it prayer, call it conversation. I'm going to have daily conversation with God. And I'm going to spend so much time with him that when he says, hello, Paul, Lord, is that you? Here I am. Send me. That's the picture that I get when I think about these things. Verse 12 says, So when he had considered this, that's that he is set free, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John. That's, uh, this is John Mark. Anybody know who John Mark is? The writer of? Mark. <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? The Gospel of Mark. Also, he traveled with? And? <laughs> you guys are so great. He traveled with Paul and he traveled with Barnabas. John Mark. Uh, he was, actually, John Mark is considered to be very, very young here. So he might be even an early teenager. But... He, so they went to the, his mom's house. It's thought that this is the Mary who had the upper room. So uh, there they are praying. It says, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. Anybody know any Rhodas? Okay, good. We're going to take another vote. Uh, the name Rhoda can also be translated Rose. So who's in favor of calling her Rhoda and who's in favor of calling her Rose? Rose. 
<laughs> oh, we know a Rose. <laughs> okay. A girl named Rose came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. <laughs> Isn't that funny? She's in shock, I guess. But she ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you're beside yourself, <laughs> which means you're crazy. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. <laughs> All right, uh, you know, the belief then of the early church was everybody's got an angel. And that very well may be. <laughs> when Jesus talked about the children, he said that their, their angels are always beholding the face of God. All right, now which one of you have, have given your angel way too much overtime? <laughs> yeah, I knew you were there, okay. I want to point something out to you here. Because there's this thing going on in the church where, which is very, very wrong. Was Peter sprung from jail because of their great faith? Apparently not. Because Peter's at the door and they're like, no, he's not. Right? So it's not their great faith. It's not like, of course, open the door. God has answered our prayers. They're like, he's not there. What were their prayers like? I think their prayers were like ours. Lord, could you? Lord, would you do this? Father, let it be your highest and best will for Peter and for all of us. He's teaching us, Lord. Spare his life. I think that that's what their prayers were like, but they were in shock that Peter actually was there. And I think of this whole thing of the church with the name it claim it. You know, visualize your destiny. That's wrong. What the Lord wants from you and what the Lord wants from me is humble servanthood. And that's it. Lord, spend my life however you want I give you all of me instead of Lord I give you a part of me <laughs> but I'm going to keep this other part for myself right Lord I'm all yours don't you know that you're not your own you've been bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body as long as you're living in this body use it to glorify God so don't be telling God what to do he's not your genie he's sovereign he's not looking for you to say the right words or dress the right way or look a certain way because we know that God does not look at the exterior God always looks at the he looks at the heart so tell me what's going on with your heart why do you want to claim that new Jaguar? You know what I mean? Yes. So I don't think they have great faith. I think they have a great God. And I think it's God's will to release Peter, and that's why that happened. And I think it was God's will to take Stephen home. And I look at some of the absolutely wonderful men that the Lord has allowed to pass through our church doors before taking them home. And you know what I, I am? I am thankful and I feel honored that God allowed those men to pass through our church doors. And that we were here to pray for them, to pray with them, to learn from them, and to love and bless and care for their families. That's what I think. Verse 16. Now Peter continued knocking because no one's answering and when they I'll stick in the, this is my own word finally opened the door and saw him they were astonished again is that great faith or is that the grace of God but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent 
I, I'm sure he wanted him to keep silent. Look at the Lord just busted me out of jail. Don't get me arrested again. I'm sure they were starting, hallelujah, praise God, Peter's here. It's like, chill. You know, I just got busted out. He declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and said, go tell these things to James. This James is the half-brother of Jesus. And this James became the first leader of the church in Jerusalem. Not Peter. James became the leader. And to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. He's like, I think this is a good time to get out of town by sundown, yeah? Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir. I think it's funny that Luke says that. What does it mean when it says there was no small stir? stir. It meant there was a big stir. If you could imagine the commotion, if you could imagine the people yelling, if you could imagine those guards, because tell me what the sentence is for a guard who loses a prisoner. Yeah, yeah that's right. Let's see what happens. But motioning to them with the sand, keep silent, declared those things uh, that the Lord had brought him out of prison. See, the Lord brought him out of prison, not because of Peter, not because of them. It was the will of God. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. He departed to another place. Then, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down to Judea, from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. I think that Herod said, I'm getting out of town too. I think he was afraid. I think that he was thinking, Maybe this God of these Christians is more powerful than I thought. I'm going to get out of town myself. Let me go someplace where I'm well accepted. So he went to Caesarea, which was the Roman capital there in Israel. Verse 20. Now Herod had been very angry. He's stomping around in Caesarea. With the people of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were not under his direct control. Tyre and Sidon were north and coastal, but they had tradings with the people of Israel. And somehow, in their trade negotiations, it had turned into a Cold War. And somehow, Tyre and Sidon did not want to be put under control of Herod. And Herod wanted to control Tyre and Sidon. And so there's a conflict between them. And he's very angry at them. And I think what he could not take out against Peter and the church at that time, he now turns his anger and his fury towards Tyre and Sidon from Caesarea, where he had some popularity. So let's see what happened. But they came to him with one accord, the people of Tyre and Sidon. And having made Blastus, is that the coolest name ever? I've never dedicated a baby named Blastus, but I think it would be really fun. Let's lift up little Blastus before the Lord. <laughs> just, it's just an awesome name. That's all I could say, you know. Blastus. <laughs> okay, Blastus is the treasurer uh, for uh, this Herod. Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, somehow Tyre and Sidon had made friends with Blastus. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. Remember, there's a famine going on. Anybody? Okay. Verse 21. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to him. Now this is a fun part because extra biblically, you can look at Josephus. Y'all know who Josephus is? A Jewish historian, alive at the same time. He wrote about this. And what he wrote was that Herod came out 
Uh, well, kind of like, you know how Elvis used to put on silver and gold threads and all that? So I don't want you to put your hair in his Elvis, but he did came out in royal, his best royal apparel. And it was all shiny silver, real silver, with threads of gold through it. That's what Josephus said. So he comes out, you know, aren't I something, you know? And he gives an oration. Now remember, the people of Tyre and Sidon said, blast us over, and they want to make Herod their friend so that they'll get more food during this time, yeah? Okay, so here he is, Herod, and he gives this great speech, you know? Uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, 21. So, uh, on a set day, Herod arrayed in uh, royal apparel, sat on a throne, and gave an oration to them. I, this, uh, you know, silly. Anyway. And the people kept shouting, The voice of a god and not of a man. Oh, boy. Then immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him. By the way, in the Greek, this word struck is the same word struck for when the angel struck Peter. So what does that tell you? If you're God's kid, the struck ain't so bad. If you're not God's kid, the struck is real bad. The Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. You can just put a ring around that 24 because we want that to happen in our church. I want that to happen in each of your lives individually, that the word of God will grow and multiply through your life, through your words, through your encouragement of other people, through whatever ministry God gives you to do. 25. Let's close this out here. Uh, this will be, I'm going to read this, but it'll be more like for next, next time. Barnabas and Saul returned from, to, from Jerusalem where they had fulfilled their ministries and they also took with them John whose surname was uh, Mark. Uh, do you remember they were taking up a collection? Do you remember this from last week or the week before? Okay, they were taking up a collection for the poor church in Jerusalem which was suffering a uh, drought. And apparently with Herod out of the picture, it was easy for Saul and Barnabas to show up and to give that offering uh, to uh, the saints in Jerusalem. So that's what that's talking about. So what do you think about Acts chapter 12? And is God speaking to you through the book of Acts? Lord, how do these things apply to my life? Ask him that. In what ways, Lord, are the things that I'm using how can that be applicable to my everyday life? Who could have imagined that this chapter would end like this after the way it started? Started out with Herod, you know, harassing the church. Ends with him out of the picture, the word of God growing, and the church being blessed. I don't know what chapter you are in in your life right now but whatever the chapter you're in i know this the best is yet to come Amen. let's pray father thank you so much for acts chapter 12. thank you father for the saints of this church family thank you father for those watching online I pray, Father, that you would touch their hearts with this word. Touch all of our hearts right now. Uh, I'd like for the worship team to come up. And that, Lord, uh, we would be willing to be used in whatever manner you prescribe. We love you, Lord, and we are thankful. Please help us, Father, to be those who are willing to share your word. For we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name, everyone says. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts right now for communion. Ushers, you may uh, distribute the communion.